The second proof they use is the saying of Umar, anhu, probably you know it very well. When he saw the people praying separately in Ramadan, each group having their Imam in the masjid, he said, why don't we make all of them with one Imam? Just like we have Taraweeh now. And he made Ubay ibn Ka'b to be the Imam and all pray behind him. So then he came and saw that and said, Ni'matil bid'atu hadihi. It is true, it is authentically narrated from Umar that he said, Ni'mati al bid'atu hadihi, which means this is a good bid'ah. Ikhwan, you know, the, the shocking thing, just like in many things, subhanAllah. Like, for example, the people when they say, My Imam or my Sheikh, he controls the universe. We say to him, how come he died if he controls the universe? He controls everything, can't control himself. It's no good. Uh, Dajjal, when he comes, will say, I'm Allah. The Prophet said it. Rain and this and wind and things like that. A very simple question. If he is Allah, his eye is a bit weird. The Prophet said he will have a, something wrong with his eye, bulging out, not looking straight. If you Allah, why can't you fix your eyes? Subhanallah. It's a good question or not? And you just think logically about it. If you Allah, what's wrong with your eye? You making rain and just fix your eyes, subhanallah, before the rain. So the people who bring this thing, saying of Umar, we have to think logically, which uh, of course, if you're, if you're following bid'ah, you have to remove logic from your aql. You have to remove logic. But if you don't, alhamdulillah, and Allah has blessed you with logical thinking, you think Umar, Umar, you know, if you know Umar ibn al-Khattab, who when he goes one way, shaitan runs from him, he says, MashaAllah, bid'ah, let's do it. So something has to, we have to think. Something, there has to be an explanation. And how come all Sahaba agree? Yani, Alhamdulillah, let's destroy the Sunnah. Ni'mat bid'at hadi, Allahu Akbar. It's great bid'ah, let's then do it. Yani, how can we think of the Sahaba like this? Radiallahu anhu. That doesn't... It's not possible to understand that logically. So we have to then think, like the Sahaba said, and the, the scholars explained, because all Sahaba agreed. All companions agreed to that. First of all, we look at the issue of praying together in the night of Ramadan is present. The Prophet did it for four nights. And he stopped because he said, I didn't want to continue because I was afraid it would have become obligatory on you. And this hadith is authentic. In Bukhari and Muslim, as far as I remember. Secondly, so Umar radiallahu anhu didn't innovate something new. The Prophet was afraid. So that fear had gone by the time Umar became Khalifa. There is no revelation coming down. There is no fear that Taraweeh will become obligatory. And Taraweeh is not obligatory. So I say to brothers and sisters who attend Taraweeh and they sleep at Fajr time, for you it's better to sleep all night but attend Fajr. It's not correct, Ikhwan, attend Taraweeh, then go out as if we're having a disco and eat and do whatever and then Fajr we sleep. For you to attend Fajr, Zuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha is much more important in Ramadan and outside Ramadan than Taraweeh. But Taraweeh is a great ibadah which is not obligatory. And it's good to do it. But it's not wajib, it's not obligatory. This is one of the proofs you can use that witr is not wajib. It's not fard. There is no difference except some ulama make a difference. But in any case, Umar by that time knew that it wasn't possible for Taraweeh to become obligatory. So he said, let's do like the Prophet did. We have one Imam, all of us, we pray behind him. So that's not bid'ah, but bid'ah in what sense? That's why we have to interpret it that way, because all of the proofs we have to collect together. 
We don't just snatch one proof and say, Allahu Akbar, run around. And if we do that, we will end up being, having strange views which are not Islamic. Like Allah said, Wala taqrabu salah. Don't approach salah. Akhi, don't pray. Because Allah said, don't approach salah. We say, what did he say? Why? Wantum sukara, if you're drunk. Wailu lil musallin. We take one ayah. Woe to those who pray. That's what some people do. And of course, people of bid'ah, people who practice bid'ah, they may not even know that they're practicing, but who practice their brainwash them and pollute their brains by saying, this is the dalil from the Quran and Sunnah. This is the proof. Every mubtadi', every innovator has proof from the Quran and Sunnah. Whether the Sunnah proof is authentic or not, that's another issue as well. But they have proofs with which they justify what they do to the people who follow them. And generally, people of innovation, especially the ones at the top, one of the signs, Ikhwan, of innovations and their leaders is that they are fabulously rich. I mean, look at Qadianis. I think all Muslims agree they are not Muslims. It's not possible to be with them an innovator just for free. You have to donate something. You know, I want to do bid'ah free. No, you have to pay. Sorry, brother. Pay. With other people also, you have to pay something every week, every day, every Allah alam what. The sheikh comes, you have to pay. Meaning, I mean, not a hundred pounds for his petrol or something. Hundred thousand maybe. Ten thousand. And that's one of the reasons people do. For power and for money and for influence. For the many things maybe. But generally for the dunya. I and mean, they don't do it with ikhlas to Allah. Because if they did, they would have left bid'ah. For that reason, we say to everyone who says bid'ah hasana, this contradicts everything we have in the sharia. Everything. We have the hadith that says, the Prophet said, Kullu bid'atin dalala. Every bid'ah is dalala. Kullu is, they call, it includes everything. Everything that is new in the religion. The person who wants to worship Allah through that. And sometimes they say, okay, then you say everything, bid'ah haram, that's what some brothers say to us. When we say, Akhi, that's bid'ah, that's haram. And we say, everything has become bid'ah then. We have nothing left, Akhi. No, we say, Alhamdulillah, we have many good things left. But he says, they say sometimes, okay, then why are you ride, uh, driving a car? We say, because cars are not bid'ah. Say, no, because they didn't exist at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi we say that is true, but we don't worship Allah by driving. If someone sits in his car and says, I want to worship Allah by driving on the M5. <laughs> then we say, brother, you mubtada. You doing a bid'ah. No one says it, alhamdulillah. I want to worship Allah driving around. No, we don't worship Allah. We want, we use cars because we want to get from A to B, from one place to another. And historically, cars and other vehicles like trains and planes and other things have replaced animals. Even though in the, when the volcano started erupting, we thought we we're going to go back to the donkeys. Because we couldn't fly, we couldn't do anything. So that is, doesn't come under bid'ah, meaning under the definition of bid'ah. That's very important to know for us. So fridges, everything that we have, computers, TVs, TV screens, uh, pens that are different, 